My name is Derek Martin. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you about horror films from 1979. I lead Mel Tennessee's horror, suspense, sci-fi, and fantasy meetup group, which started in 2011. We meet in the Nashville area to watch both classic and new films together. We've grown to over 2,200 members, making us the third largest horror-related meetup group in the world. I occasionally rent movie theaters for special screenings just for the group. You can learn more by going to meetup.com and searching on horror near Nashville. 1979 was a big year for horror films. Three major horror franchises started. The biggest of the three franchises was from Alien, directed by Ridley Scott, which is being discussed elsewhere in this podcast. For the second franchise, do you recognize this theme? It's Phantasm. It's about a teenage boy who, along with his friends, take on a mysterious grave robber who is known as the Tall Man. He's turning the dead into zombies. One of the Tall Man's weapons is a chrome spear that penetrates skulls with a needle. Writer Don Coscarelli directed Phantasm the next three sequels. Don was producer on the last Phantasm film, released in 2016. You might recognize two of Don's other films, The Beastmaster and Bubba Hotap. Now, two actors appeared in all five Phantasm films, Reggie Bannister and Angus Scrimm, who played the tall man. After watching the original Phantasm at Full Moon Simplex in Hermitage, Tennessee, I screened the four sequels at my home one Saturday. We enjoyed the first two sequels, but felt they dropped in quality with the last two. The third franchise comes from the Amityville Horror. Newlyweds, played by James Brolin and the late Margaret Kidder, move into a large house where a mass murder was committed, and experience strange manifestations. The film was based on the alleged experiences of the Lutz family who bought a home in Amityville, New York, and was the first film based on this story. Amityville 2, The Possession, starred Dan Franklin from Better Off Dead. This sequel is well worth watching. The next film in the series, Amityville 3D, was not as well received, but it does co-star Lori Laughlin and Meg Ryan in early roles. There were five more sequels made that also had poor reviews. In 2005, a remake came out, and lastly, in 2017, Amityville The Awakening came out, which I've read establishes all the prior films as fiction. Now, let's discuss what a big year 79 was for vampire films. The most well-reviewed film is Nosferatu the Vampire. Klaus Kinski plays the Count. This film is directed by Werner Herzog, who directed Kinski in other famous films, including Aguirre, The Wrath of God, and Fitzcarraldo. Kinski was a very temperamental actor on set, and Herzog once claimed that while shooting on location near the Amazon River, a local chieftain who was tired of Kinski's outburst offered to kill Kinski for Herzog. Nosferatu the Vampire was a remake of the 1922 silent film Nosferatu. A little bit of history here. The original Nosferatu was made without permission of the Stoker estate, who then successfully sued to have all copies destroyed. Fortunately, a few prints survived. John Malkovich and William Defoe fans will want to check out Shadow of the Vampire from 2000, which is about the making of the original Nosferatu. Salem's Lot was a TV miniseries based on the Stephen King novel. It was directed by the late Toby Hooper, who brought us Poltergeist and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Salem's Lot starred David Soul. The vampire will remind you of the Nosferatu film's vampire. When the meetup group watched this together, the scary scene where a levitated child vampire appears outside another child's window received the most praise. A new Dracula came out in 79. It stars Frank Langella as Dracula, who had played the role on stage. Langella wanted his portrayal to be distinguished from Bela Lugosi's and played Dracula as more romantic. Donald Pleasance plays Dr. Seward. Perhaps the greatest actor ever plays Van Helsing, Sir Lawrence Olivier. For our Doctor Who fans out there, this Dracula film co-starred future seventh Doctor Sylvester McCoy in his first film appearance. An honorable mention goes out to the 79 comedy film Love at First Bite, where George Hamilton plays Dracula. 
let's touch on some other vampire films from 79. First, we have the disco German sex comedy film Dracula Blows is Cool. Second, Nocturna, where Dracula's granddaughter falls in love with a guitarist and runs away with him. Nocturna stars John Carradine as Dracula, who also played Dracula in the 1940s Universal horror films House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein. Yvonne DiCarlo, known for playing Lily Munster, co-stars. Third, the Australian film Thirst, co-starring David Hemmings from Blow Up and Deep Red, involves a descendant of Elizabeth Bathory. Fourth, Nightwing with David Warner is about killer bats on a reservation in New Mexico. Fifth, Fascination by French film director Rollin, who is known for his erotic vampire films. And lastly, one of my favorite TV films titled Vampire with the late Richard Lynch as the vampire. While the above is more than enough to make it for a memorable year in horror, we have a lot more to go over. I recommend watching these films if you haven't before. Licio Fulci's Zombie involves a group searching for a young woman's missing father on a tropical island where the dead are returning to life. This fine entry in the zombie canon is remembered for one of the best eyeball violence scenes ever, a zombie fighting a shark and the film score. Fulci was one of the best Italian horror film directors, also known for The Beyond and House by the Cemetery. Director David Cronenberg's The Brood is about a man investigating unconventional therapy techniques on his institutionalized wife amidst a series of brutal murders. This film stars Oliver Reed. David Cronenberg would later peak as a director in the 1980s with Scanners, Videodrome, The Dead Zone, and The Fly remake. Sherlock Holmes fans may remember Murder by Decree, where Christopher Plummer plays a more emotional Sherlock Holmes. In this film, Holmes investigates the murders committed by Jack the Ripper and discovers a conspiracy to protect the killer. Another film about Jack the Ripper is Time After Time. H.G. Wells pursues Jack the Ripper to the 20th century when the, when the serial murderer uses the future writer's time machine to escape his time period. This film stars Malcolm McDowell and David Warner. It was directed in 79 by Nicholas Meyer, who is best known as the director of the Star Trek films The Wrath of Khan and The Undiscovered Country. 79 was also the year between two major happenings in the slasher genre. In 78, the world was introduced to Michael Myers in Halloween. In 1980, the first Friday the 13th film arrived in theaters, changing how we think about summer camp forever. But 79 itself boasts some important slasher films. When a Stranger Calls was quite a thriller when a psychopathic killer terrorizes a babysitter and returns to miss her and her family seven years later. Both Carol Kane and Charles Durning returned to their roles in the 1993 sequel, When a Stranger Calls Back. This original 79 film is very different from the 2006 remake, and I recommend watching both. 79's The Driller Killer had the honor of being on the United Kingdom's Video Nasties list. Driller Killer is now a look back at urban decay in New York City and the punk rock scene. After four decades, some slasher films like this one, and especially Al Pacino's Cruising from 1980, takes us back to a different time and are worth revisiting. 79's Tourist Trap stars The Rifleman's Chuck Connors and Sheena's Tanya Roberts. A horror film director told me that this is one of the scariest films he's seen due to the mannequins. Fans of Barbara Steele, who gained fame in 1960's Black Sunday, will want to check out the silent scream co-starring the Boogans' Rebecca Balding. Don't Go on the House is a disturbing slasher where they, you watch women burnt alive with a flamethrower. Lastly, Savage Weekend was released in 79, although it was made in 76, thus predating Halloween. Savage Weekend has been cited as an early prototype for the slasher film, before the market was flooded with the slashers in the 80s. Let's touch on creature features from 79. 1975's Jaws was still inspiring aquatic horror films with the release of Barbara Bach's Screamers, Karen Black's Killer Fish, and Up From the Depths. 
Also, director John Frankenheimer gave us the environmental awareness film Prophecy, starring Talia Shire and Robert Foxworth, where a law company's waste creates a giant killer bear monster. It's better than it sounds. A few more horror films from 79 worth mentioning are the horror anthology Screams of a Rare Night, the nunsploitation classic Killer Nun, and the well-regarded Beyond the Darkness, where a husband decides to keep his dead wife by turning her into a doll. We also had a contribution to prison horror films this year with Human Experiments, where a demented prison doctor, played by cult icon Jeffrey Lewis, performs shock therapy experiments on inmates. I'll conclude by mentioning one more horror film that, while I won't say it's good, it is worth checking out for those who like camp. It's The Visitor, with a great score, a child with telekinetic powers, director Maltese Falcon, John Huston, playing a babysitter, and Django star Franco Nero playing a Christ-like figure. Well, thanks for letting me talk with you about the horror films of 79. And as we say in the horror meetup, don't watch bad horror films alone. Suffering through them with friends makes us all stronger. So please join the horror meetup. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu. Nanu.